All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and we'll get into our sessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercies over each of our lives. Thank you for the gift of life and just the opportunity to come together and to learn from your word, of God. And even as we learn about church planting, about leading, about Lord, uh, starting up churches, Lord, we pray that you will give us the grace, you will give us the wisdom, the discernment, Lord, that we will learn and, and apply it in our lives, oh God. We come at this time of, of, of studying and learning into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right, so last class we... Uh, covered portions of chapter 14, and we also did chapter 15. Chapter 14 was important. We talked about the stages of growth uh, when it comes to a local church, right? So we look at many aspects, just like how in a natural, in, in the natural, a baby grows and goes through stages of life, the same way a local church goes through stages, right? So what did we see? We saw the pioneering stage, Right, the first stage that is then as the church grows, you get into the administrative, organizational, and structural stage. Right now, normally we would wait for about maybe 50 or 100 people and get into administrative stage. Then you have the pastoral stage, team stage, and senior pastor stage. So, uh, if you are the pioneer of the ministry, there will come a stage when you will have pastors under you. They will have you you will have to be able to build team ministries and last week we talked about guidelines for every ministry um, especially in apc something that we have is guidelines right everything is put down on paper and then you move into the role of a senior pastor stage now the fourth and the fifth stage uh, we spoke about was this is somewhere where uh, where apc is standing right now right we are in the equipping stage we want to equip people we want to build people train them up to be good leaders and also an apostolic function state. So we move into not only just looking at, you know, being within the church, but also going out and building God's kingdom, doing conferences, meetings, and all of that, right? So here's a very important point. Learn to be patient. Learn to journey along the seasons that God takes us through, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we're in a hurry to do God's work. Um, you know, we know that God has called us. There's the anointing, there's the gift, there's the skills, there's the, um, you know, there's, there's is the opportunities. That's wonderful, right? But learn to journey along with what God is doing, right? There'll come a time, right? For everything, there's a season. Uh, God is a God who works through seasons, right? Now, if you look at for example, APC. Now we are at one season. Now five years down the line, we may be in a different season, right? We may come up with new ideas, new strategies, new plans. Things may change, right? So we journey along with God. Right? If you look back 2001 onwards, in 2005, 2006, we were, we were at a certain stage. Okay, we were maybe in the administrative stage, just maybe we were about 200 odd people. Then we started growing. Right? We went into this pastoral team stage. People joined the pastoral team. Right Now, as a pioneer, here's the thing. You must have the picture, the end picture, right from the beginning. Right, You must have the picture of what you want to see or how you want to see your ministry. Right Now, that's, that's the work that we have to do. And we work towards it. Here's the thing, I, know, I was reading about this, so beautiful. There's God's sovereignty and our responsibility. And they both go hand in hand. See, it is God's sovereign will that we all become, we all come through Jesus Christ, uh, you know, get to, we know Jesus, become believers. That's God's sovereign will. But Peter, oh, is it Peter here? And he says, work out your own salvation, James says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, man's responsibility, right? For he predestined, Ephesians 1, he predestined us in Christ. Again, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. So you have God's sovereignty, you have 
man's responsibility. We need to learn to balance that together. Now, God's sovereign will is what? That he wants us to, you know, if it's planting a church, building a church, he wants us to do well in that. But there's man's responsibility. So we put them both together. Okay, so we grow, we see growth, we see consolidation. The word consolidate, it means to strengthen what you already have, right? Now, as you grow as a church, local church, don't forget to strengthen the local church right? because it's very easy to get into a place of only being apostolic, right? Like going out, going out. But Paul writes and he says that we, we need to be strong. We cannot be... Uh, you know, babies in Christ. We need to grow uh, spiritually. So there's the, that aspect as well. So as a leader, you must make sure that there's consolidation, strengthening what you have so that you can send it out. Okay, we also looked at chapter 15 last class. Chapter 15 was uh, multiplication and branching out, right? So we looked at different aspects. Uh, you can plant multi-site churches, uh, plant new churches in different parts of the city. Now, these churches can work independently. They can work as a, um, uh, as one church and many congregations. That's what we have at APC. We are one church with five congregations in Bangalore, right? But we are one church. So I gave you examples, right? So, uh, you know, as, as a pastoral team, we serve in different locations. Like most of the time we are maybe at one location, but there will be times we will go to other locations. Now it does not mean that, you know, I'm going to another different church or something, right? APC is one, but we have five different congregations. That is why we have the same sermons preached at all locations, right? Uh, now you can work that way or you can work independently. Now, if you look at our outreach churches, they don't follow what we are preaching. We are preparing preaching on their own because now the context there is different to the context here. Right? Messages and sermons that are relevant here may not be relevant there. And sermons that are relevant there may not be relevant here. Right? So we let them to work independently, but still they are part of APC. Right? So they're the outreach churches. So, now, all of these things you can, you know, uh, decide and take time to make decisions over, right? How to uh, set things in place. Envision them, very important. Envision people. As a leader, we need to envision them, right? Uh, meaning you you share the vision. What, what do you want to see in their church and in, in the location or the congregation that they are ministering to, right? Okay, chapter 16. Chapter 16 is basically urban church growth models. Now, we must remember that most of these churches that we see here are, are huge churches, mega churches. Uh, but remember that each of these churches may have different ways or different strategies of growth models. Right Now, Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea, was, it was only through cell groups. That the church just multiplied, came up to about 800,000 people each Sunday attending church. Right? They were a small church, but the cell group model worked. So, if you look at this, there are many churches, even in our nation, that have grown to be mega churches. But you and I need to find out what model can I replicate or what model can I implement to make sure that. My church is growing. My congregation is growing. Right? Now, there are certain things that works in Korea, which may not work in India. There are certain things that work in Singapore or in the United States, which may not work in Korea. You get what I'm saying? right? So you need to find your place and how you can, what models you can use to uh, see that the church grows. Now, example, if you're planting a church in a village, will worship evening work in a village? Oh, right. Worship evening is, it may not really work. So I need to see, find out, okay, ways, how, what can I do in this village or town that I'm going to plant a church? What can I do to see the church grow? It's definitely 
I won't say definitely, but worship evening should be the last option. Now, if you're in a city or you're in a town and you see a lot of colleges, you see a lot of uh, youth, uh, working professionals, then you can say, hey, we can do like a worship evening, maybe once a month, try it out. And if you're in a village, can you do uh, uh, timeless principles of the workplace uh, conference? You can do it, but it's not going to be effective. Right? You can just do it, but it's not going to be effective. But what can I do if it's in a village setting, who we are in Christ, fulfilling God's purposes, faith, topics like that? right? Uh, or you can, if it's a village setting, something that you can do is, uh, you know, supernatural Sunday or miracle day, miracle service, right? All these things will work there. So you need to find out where, what works, and implement the ideas and plans, right? And eventually, uh, work towards church growth. Right? Never be satisfied. Like, okay, this is a number. We are getting in the funds. We are getting. We are doing ministry. So I'm satisfied. No. I have that vision to grow, right? Again, the numbers is not the focus, but your focus is also, I need to build up, raise up leaders, raise up new ministries, raise up teams that can serve in the church, raise up the next generation of leadership who can take over. That's also your focus, right? And eventually you will see growth, right? If you see the APC biblical blueprint model, we, we follow... Um, we follow cell groups, life groups, teaching of the word, praying, uh, uh, you know, uh, ministry of healing and deliverance, the supernatural ministry. Just follow all of that. People will learn and come in, and the church will eventually grow. Right? So let's get into now. We've been looking at the natural aspects. Let's look into spiritual aspects, right? Chapter 17, very important chapter. We'll take some time on this chapter, right? The real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. The real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. Now, we talked about this. When you and I decide that we want to do ministry, it's a spiritual battle. The first thing that comes to our mind, we must tell ourselves, I'm in the battlefield now. And now, it's not like only if you're in ministry or on the battlefield. You can be anywhere you're on the battlefield. But now it's like you're stepping in. right? Now, God is at work in our cities. But over time, we know that there, there is also demonic activities that are happening around us. Many, many demonic activities. Now, remember, if we look at what's happening around us, there's so much that the enemy is using. The enemy can take something that is good and pervert it and make it evil. Now, look at what's happening around the church right now. Somebody sent me a clip. I was sharing with the second years. Somebody sent me a clip where this mega church, okay, um, the preacher had. The, there was they were all wearing football jerseys you know the american football where they hold the ball and they kick it so they were all wearing those jerseys and somebody had some one of them was holding the bible and the preacher came and kicked it kicked the bible and they said oh it's a goal now somebody sent me that clip so i, I don't know so many so many things like this now you see this is a church Good thing what people coming to church, mega churches now, all 5,000 and above, right? Big churches. But you got this. Then you have people, you know, fleecing people, you know, pastors or leaders fleecing people. You know, if you don't give, God will curse you and all of those things. Now, they've started the church, which is for a good reason, but the enemy takes it and defiles it. He can take God's word and defile it. He can deceive people. Now, already there's evil. That's no problem. But he can take what's good and turn it for evil. Right? We see spiritual beings 
influencing natural leaders over the cities. And we see that in, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, the ruler of Tyre, right? But anyways, let's go further on. I want to talk about this. Satan's work in hindering the salvation of the lost. Now, you and I, the moment we begin to want to share the gospel with people or we want to minister to people, Satan is hindering the work of the gospel. Think of this. The enemy knows every single word in the scripture, meaning he knows the power of God's word. So he, Satan and his demons will do his best to stop us from reading God's word. Right? He'll do his best to stop us from prayer and reading God's word. Because the moment we read God's word, there is a possibility that some of the most cruel people on earth can become believers just by reading this word. And Satan knows it. The word of God, Hebrews 4.12 says, it is alive, powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword, that penetrates, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That means what? When the moment we take up this word, the enemies and his demons have two things in mind. One, stop him from reading, or two, make him disbelieve what he's reading. Okay? Either bring distractions, hey, don't read the word. Or two, okay, I'm not able to stop him from reading, but let me make it in a way that this is just a story and it's not real. What does he do? Number one, he blinds the minds of people. Now, there are many, many leaders who, re who have read God's word. Same thing. There's power in God's word. Many of them have read it, but not everyone believe in it. Why? Because the devil blinds people's minds. Let's read uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Yes, go ahead. Anyone can read. But even if our gospel is valid, well, it is well to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Hmm. Look at that. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled. The word veiled means covered, right? Is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. Why? Why is that? Verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the mind of believers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God. The God of this age, Satan and his demons, have blinded people so that they don't see the glory of God. So let me give you a picture. Imagine this. You've shared the gospel with somebody. You give them the Bible. Right? And you give them, given them the book of John. So they open the Bible to the book of John and they begin to read. Right? They go to John chapter 1 and they start reading. Right? Okay, this person gave me the Bible. Let me read. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. So this guy is read. This person is reading it. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Now, there are two things the enemy is doing. One, he's saying, the beginning was the word. How can there be a word in the beginning? Now, he'll try to bring the most foolish deceptions. And that's how he is. Right? They say, no, this is too boring. He'll stop from reading. I don't want this. Or option two. We're going on reading. First time the person is reading, he's not stopping. Somewhere in his heart, he's going on reading. He's come to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And the devil starts saying, How can the word become? What does that word become flesh? It's, it's not making sense. Is it some stories? No, this is not true. And they push it away. What's he doing? He's blinding people's eyes. 
minds, people's minds. Now, when you and I pray and say, God, I've given the Bible to this person. He's going to read it. Lord, I pray that you will open his eyes and you will speak to him. Now, he's reading the same verse. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, there's something. Oh, what is this? The word became flesh. What does it mean? I need to find out. And though he, he keeps reading, we have seen his glory. Who has seen his glory? Later on, John is saying, John testifies. He says, I have seen it. I have seen his glory. I'm not talking secondhand proof. I'm talking about firsthand eyewitnesses. And then this person goes on to read. And then he goes into chapter 2. Jesus changes the water into wine. Chapter 3, Jesus talks about being born again. And now this person is saying, I want to be born again. I want to know how it feels. Chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. See, how did Jesus know about that Samaritan woman? Chapter 5, Jesus heals the uh, man in the pool of Bethesda. How does he know this? How did Jesus do this? There was nobody else I know who could have read about who brought healing, like this kind of healing. So what's happening? The heart is opening. But in each stage, the devil is still trying his best. And this is what he does. He blinds the minds of people. He doesn't want us to believe. He doesn't want people to believe. But here's the encouraging aspect for us. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So all we need to do is preach the gospel, share the gospel, and the Holy Spirit will begin to work in their lives. That's all we have to do. Pray against principalities, against any demonic work. Bring it down. Bring, on, bring down those strongholds. And then pray for people. Now, these are things that we must do as leaders, right? Two, holding people in bondage. The enemy holds people in bondage. Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 2. Let's read that. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. You use it to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Mm. Let's read 1 John 5 19 as well. One John five nineteen. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Mm. We know that we are of God, but the whole world lies. My version says under the control, or under the sway of the evil one. So here's what people what the enemy does. We touched on this a little bit in lifestyle evangelism as well. Here's what the enemy does. The enemy puts people in bondages. Bondages simply mean spiritual prisons. When you are in a prison, are you free? Right. In the natural, when you when you see people in prison, they're not free. They can't say they can't go order KFC or uh, order food from outside. They can't go out for a stroll in the park. They can't do that. They're in prison. They're in a place of bondage. Right. Unless they are set free. Unless they say, okay, now you there's nothing, there's no guilt upon you, you're free to go, you, you have not committed any, any uh, sin, so you're free to go. You let them, then they're free. Now, here's what the enemy does. He puts people into spiritual prisons, spiritual bondages. So it could be pornography, it could be addictions of drinking smoking drugs uh, uh you know it could be any other kinds of addictions right now i would say phone is an addiction right uh we can put people into an addiction of you know uh, you know this people who think about something and there's fear always right? fear fear of life fear of failure Every time there's fear, 
These are addictions, spiritual prisons that the enemy puts people in. Now, why does he do that? It's like holding them in bondage. Even if they sometimes read God's word, what they do, or they listen to God's word, because of the bondage, that spiritual prison that is overpowering them, they're not able to let go. Of course, we know God's word is much powerful, but there are sometimes there are areas in our, in our life when a person is in bondage, he's not, he or she is not able to let go. And then the enemy keeps suppressing them. So they're not able to get through the gospel into their hearts. Right? Uh, these are spirits of disobedience that is at work. There is demonic bondages, areas of demonic domination. The more I give the enemy control, if I know in a certain area a person uh, you know, uh, has a bondage or is weak in a certain area, I need to immediately, as a believer, surrender that portion of my life to God and say, God, this is my weakness. Please help me. Help me to overcome it. The moment I don't do that and I keep going on and on into that, in that sin, it becomes a deep hole. And it's very hard later on to come out of that bondage. That's why if you look at people who are addicted, especially if you look at, I'm just giving an example, if you look at drugs, you know, at a certain point, no matter what you say, it, it doesn't really affect them at one point. Initially, they cry, they say, I don't want to do this, I don't want to be this, you know, I don't want to get this, I, I want to change my life. But at one point, it says, I can't. I can't come out of this. It's impossible for me. Why? Because they feel they this is a weakness. They've gone down into a hole deeper, deeper, deeper. And what is happening? The enemy has really oppressed them, like you know, just pressed them down. Put them into a prison, not only in the prison, tied them up. Right? Like a, taking a tight rope and tying them up. They can't even do anything. They are at the mercy of the enemy. That is where you and I need to bring forth the power of the gospel. It breaks those chains. The Bible says the anointing breaks the chain. The anointing of the Holy Spirit breaks bondages. You understand what's happening now? The enemy wants us to, he wants to bind people and holding them into bondage. Then he, what the enemy does is he hinders the proclamation of the gospel. Let's read Romans 15, 30 and 31. Romans 15, 30 and 31. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem be acceptable to the saints. Yeah, so here Paul is saying, it's very interesting. Did Paul do a great ministry? He went to places, he planted churches, he did a wonderful ministry. Now, he's writing here, he's saying, you pray for me so that there will be no hindrance of the gospel when I'm trying to go to places, there shouldn't be any hindrance, right? That God will open a door for me, that I may be able to go and preach and minister and bring lives to Christ. He's praying. So what does it teach us? It teaches us that the devil hinders the work of the proclamation of the gospel. That means what? Now, some of us may say, okay, God, you have called me. I want to go to this place, this town or this city and start a church and start a ministry. Now, the enemy will do his best to stop you from doing that. You know why? Because he knows that if this guy or this person goes back to his hometown, starts a church, people will come. And if people come, they will hear the message. If they hear the message, they may believe the message. 
Now, let me go to the root cause. The root cause is this guy, this person wants to start a church. Or he wants to share the gospel. So let me bring something in his life, whether it is a problem in his family, uh, uh, maybe a material need, maybe money, maybe physical challenges, anything to stop this person from hindering the gospel. Now for Paul, he had many, many people against him. The Romans itself, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Pharisees, many people were against him. Right? So, so he had many people coming against him, but still he's saying, pray that there will be no hindrance for me to preach the gospel. So it teaches us that even as we prepare right, to serve and to uh, plant churches, to minister in churches, the spiritual aspect of spending time in God's presence is of utmost importance. Remember, the enemy is looking around. And if we are the root cause of people be, be, to bring fear, right? Remember, the Ephesians chapter 6 says, He has given us the armor, right? So we're not to be fearful of the enemy, but we need to be on guard because he's able to bring confusion, he's able to stop us from hindering the gospel. Last one, fourth one, weakening the local church by infiltration. You know what does infiltration means? Infiltrate means to come into a certain place unwelcomed. It's to sneak in from the back door. Here's what the enemy did in these uh, four churches in the book of Revelation chapter 2. Church of S in Smyrna, a presence of a group of people that belong to Satan. We talked about this, right? Devil is going to cause some of them to be put in prison. See, there's a presence of people, of a group of people that belongs to Satan within the church, and the enemy is going to use spirits and demonic activity to get people to be put into prison so that the gospel will not be shared. Again, the enemy is not only working from outside, he's working from inside also, within the church, causing some of them to be put in prison. Some of, now, what will happen? Maybe if we put them into prison, they will deny Jesus and they'll go back to what they were doing. Right? Two, the church in Pergamos. Place where Satan's throne is and Satan dwells. Doctrine of Balaam is infiltrating the church. Now, I would encourage you, read Numbers chapter 23 onwards. Read the story of Balaam. It is very interesting because God tells Balaam, I will, whoever, whoever you bless, I will bless. Whoever you curse, I will curse. Now, that's a great thing to get from a prophet, from God, for a prophet. It's a great thing. God is saying, whoever I bless, God will bless. Whoever I curse, God will curse. Now, if you go through the story of Balaam, Balak is a Moabite king. Balak says, these Israelites are defeating everyone. Now these Israelites are going to come against the Moabites. We cannot defeat them. So here's what I'm, let's do. Let's go to the prophet. So they go to Balaam. Balak says, I'm just giving you the understanding of what happened there. Balak says, come and curse Israel. Balaam says, no. How can I curse Israel? Second time they come again. Balaam, come and curse Israel. You know what Balaam says? Let me pray about it. He goes back and prays. God, should I curse Israel? What did God say? Did I told you, how can you curse Israel? When I have blessed Israel, they are my children. How can you curse them? You cannot do anything. Third time, again Balaam comes. Can you please curse Israel? And Balaam says, no, I can't do it. But you know what he did? If you read the story carefully, the next chapter, chapter 24, Numbers 24, Balak gives Balaam, sorry, Balaam gives the king of Moab, uh, Balak, the way to defeat the Israelites. You know what he says? He says, what you do is, you send the women 
Moabite women into the Israeli camp, they will fall into temptation. They will sin against God and God will curse them. Then you'll be able to defeat the Israelites. See what he did? Balak, Balaam, as a prophet, he went back very happy. Oh, I didn't curse Israelites. But God is saying here, don't be like Balaam. Surprising, no? Such a great honor. Who you bless, I will bless. Who you curse, I will curse. Here he's saying, don't be like Balaam. Because in his mind, it was only money and it was only wealth or and he, he was not really looking at God's heart. And here is a place where the doctrine of Balaam is infiltrating the church. False prophecies, false divinations, sorceries, all of that is happening here. The church in Thyatira, false prophet Jezebel is at work. And we know the word Jezebel is, she was a Phoenician woman. And a Baal worshipper, that's why Jezebel. Now, the spirit of Jezebel is working in this church. So it's come in to infiltrate and to stop the work of the gospel. And then the church in Philadelphia, presence of a group that belongs to Satan, will cause them to bow before the church. Again, not only is the enemy working towards getting people away from the gospel, but he's getting people to believe in him, believe in Satan, bow down for the things of the enemy. Meaning what? It could be, you know, idol worship. It could be a worship of images. Worship of, you know, now, now when we talk about idol worship, it doesn't necessarily have to be an idol. Right? Anything that we give place to higher than God becomes an idol. So these are ways that the enemy can also infiltrate the church. What is our responsibility? You and I, as the church, what is our responsibility? What must we do? How must we, uh, you know, how much, how, how do we challenge these oppositions that the enemy is bringing? Firstly, the church is to be the light to the Gentiles, open prisons doors, and bringing those in darkness out of the prison house. The church has kingdom authority and spiritual weapons to overthrow what the devil is doing. You get that? The church has kingdom authority. Jesus said that, I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Now, Jesus is look, he's, he's giving us all of this even before the cross. Right? And he's looking at the cross. He's looking at what he's going to accomplish on the cross. And he's saying, I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Colossians 2, 15 says, he made a public spectacle of the enemy triumphing over them through the cross. When the Lord Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, he destroyed the powers of the devil. But does it look like the enemy is defeated? Sometimes we feel no, because he's doing so much around us. The truth is, the enemy is defeated. If the church, that is you and I, and the the church, the body of Christ, takes on our responsibility, takes on the mantle of being that you know that child of a God, using our kingdom authority, then we will see victory. But if we have people who are standing up in pulpits and preaching unwanted things, wasting time, not building up people, not encouraging, talking from the word of God, just feel good sermons, it is not going to help. We need kingdom authority. The church has kingdom authority. We need to teach people how to use your spiritual authority, but spiritual weapons that God has given us. Now, when you go into the army, right? If you join the army, can you say, hey, give me the gun, I want to use it? Because going to, hey, there's training. We have to train you how to use it. First of all, for you to get into the army, you need to be trained. You need to have some physical abilities uh, to get into the army. Now, you get into the army. It's not like first day they'll say, take the gun, start shooting. No, they're going to train you how to use it. And eventually, you'll learn, you'll grow, then you'll move from hand pistols to machine guns and whatever. You just go up. Now, imagine this. You're in the army. 
you have your gun with you and you're seeing the enemy coming will the enemy sit there itself oh the enemy will this person who's a soldier sit there oh the enemy is coming what do i do will we do that if we do that we are foolish but if we have the gun and we're sitting we're looking at the enemy and we're afraid doesn't make sense the captain of the army will say hey you have the gun with you come on use it and what if this man says you know i've not used it for so many years i've forgotten how to use the machine gun now you went through the training you know how to use it you spent hours and hours and hours months on months and years on years aiming at targets using the machine gun now is the real chance now here's the real enemy coming you have to use it but at that moment if i say i don't know how to use it it's of no use right. so uh, you and i as leaders we have to train others to use the spiritual weapons one of the greatest spiritual weapon that we have and i always say this is the word of god i'm telling you if you and i are able to stand on this word it is the strongest foundation we can stand on revelation says we overcome the adversary the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony blood of the lamb the word of our testimony jesus set the example for us all we need to do is follow it there are times we will feel weak we will times we will feel weary we will, times we feel like giving up Let's go back to the word speak the word speak the word of faith let faith arise in your heart right so unless we teach it people will not know how to use it right so as a church we must teach people very important right something that we do at apc is our focus is that every believer is a minister and we want to train every believer to become good ministers of god right? uh, we don't want people to come attend church and just go we want them to come we want, that's why we have all of these conferences events uh you know weekend schools bible college uh so that they can join they can learn they can grow they can you know i would say for me for me personally there's so much i learned now if nobody taught me how will i know it you get what i'm saying i have to we have to teach people and they learn it and they begin to use their uh weapons that god has given us now finally we use our spiritual weapons using our spiritual weapons we can destroy the blindness that satan creates using our spiritual weapons we can destroy the blindness that satan creates so what can we say god we can use god's word we can say lord you said they shall know the truth and the truth will set them free so lord even as i minister to this person even as i share the gospel preach on sundays and minister during the week lord let your truth come forth and let them know your truth and let that truth set them free from every bondage right use that spiritual weapon that god has given so that people may receive the light of the gospel on the basis of the finished work of the, of Christ on the cross and using our spiritual authority we destroy satan's strongholds and spiritual prisons on people's lives so basically what are we doing is the moment we begin to use our spiritual weapons it's like we are going to those spiritual prisons opening the spiritual you know opening the prison doors going to the person who the enemy has bound removing or untying that rope tying that rope to satan himself or his demons bringing out this person from that place of bondage and setting him free you get that picture in your mind it's like you're going rescuing that person binding the works of the demons there and setting him free that's what we are actually doing in the spiritual in the natural what we are doing all we are doing is sharing a god maybe a tract or sharing a verse but in the spiritual something is happening right uh, we use our spiritual authority and we destroy satan's strongholds 
This is called spiritual warfare. I love what Paul writes and he says, he writes to Timothy towards the end in 2 Timothy, this is his last few, his last letter. He knows he's going to be executed. He says, Paul, Timothy, you fight the good fight of faith because there is a reward for you. He says, he, Paul is saying, I don't run for a reward for a crown that that is earthly, where it that earthly crown would rust away. But I run a race knowing that I will win an imperishable crown, a crown that will not rust, a crown that can never be destroyed. Paul is writing this so powerfully. If you read First and Second Timothy, it's beautiful. It's words of love, words of wisdom, words of authority, saying, now you fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. It's a battle. Now, one more important thing. Choose the battles that you fight wisely. Don't fight every battle. There are some battles that are not worth fighting, number one. There are some battles you are not yet ready to fight. May God may, may ask you to wait for some time. So even as you choose battles, there are some battles not worth fighting. Somebody says, you know what, you're, as a church you are doing this, or as a minister you are doing this, and if you know you are doing something that is right in line with God's word, don't fight the battle. That's not a battle that you want to waste time on. Let it go. Now, if there are battles that God is asking you to wait for, then you wait. So, for example, you're in a city, God tells you, you know, I want, you know, there are places that you feel, you you desire, you want to go to this place and, uh, you know, do a conference or do a ministry uh, or, you know, just minister to leaders there. And this place is maybe a very dangerous place. God may tell you to wait. It's okay to wait. Maybe he wants to equip you more for the battle ahead. Right? But here's 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 the whole thing. The moment you and I become believers, that moment onwards, we are in a spiritual warfare. And there's a battle. There's a battle of the good and the evil, of God's plan and the enemy's plan. And that is why we must be well equipped to fight this battle effectively. Right? If you look at the army, is there sacrifice for them? Example, the Indian army, is there sacrifice for those who are in the Indian army? A lot of sacrifice, right? It's not like they can get up at 10 o'clock and go have breakfast. No, they have certain rules. They wake up early, they have to go for their trainings, intense training. They can't eat. You know, recently I just went to a army hospital and it was one of the first times that I went into an army hospital it was just a few days back I have never seen a hospital that is as clean as that not even a wrapper was on the ground it felt like a different world altogether right and right uh, sharing it with the first years right at the entrance there's one guy who there's a there's an officer who's sitting in one like a steel cage right at the entrance, and and I noticed him. He's got a machine gun right at the entrance, and he's sitting. So I asked him where to park. He didn't even look left. He said go to. He, he's just looking at the. He said go and ask that entrance gate. High alert. Because what if anybody comes with the machine gun? He's sitting there. And the way the people are inside, it's a different world altogether. They are on high alert. If you're sitting in the car, they came, you know, I was sitting in the car. They came and they asked, what happened? Why are you sitting here? And I'm waiting for somebody. They've gone to visit a family. Okay. They're on high alert. Every, everyone are on high alert. That's how it is. It's not like our regular hospitals, people are sitting outside, chit-chatting. No, it's very different. You and I are in a spiritual battle. We are in the army of God. We are on high alert. Right? 
Okay, so we'll stop here. Or well, what what we'll do is the next hour, well, you can just spend time studying on your own. Uh, I wasn't able to prepare much in this uh, the next chapter, so we'll pick up from next class. We have a lot of time as well, right? So we'll pick up chapter eighteen from next Tuesday. Tuesday is our next class. Yes. Okay. So next Tuesday. So use this hour to just study, read, uh, and then we'll meet next week. Right. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Oh, have a good week ahead. God bless.